Welcome to History Talk, the podcast that brings together a panel of experts to discuss current events and historical perspective. I'm your host, Brenna Miller. And I'm your other host, Jessica Venus Nelson. During the 2016 season, former San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick began kneeling during the national anthem to protest the oppression of black people and people of color in the United States. He vowed to continue protesting until the American flag, quote, represents what it is supposed to represent. Initially, only a few players joined Kaepernick, but after President Donald Trump tweeted that NFL players should be fired if they failed to stand for the national anthem in the fall of 2017, outcry against the protest came to dominate NFL coverage and other sports as well. Critics of the protest lamented that athletes should not have brought politics into sports, but sports have never been immune from politics. Today we have three guests in the studio to discuss the history of sports and protest. Dr. Hassan Jeffries is an associate professor of history at The Ohio State University and a specialist in 20th century African American history. Hi, good to be here. We also have Dr. Robert Bennett, a program specialist with a dual appointment with Ohio State University's Office of International Affairs and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. He also researches education opportunities for student athletes. Hello, good evening, glad to be here. And finally, also in the studio with us, we have Mark Horger, a senior lecturer in the Department of Human Sciences at The Ohio State University, specializing in the history of American sports. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us today. Briefly, what are the recent NFL protests about exactly, and why has there been an outcry against them? Like many of the things we're arguing about in the culture right now, it's about two or three things simultaneously, which is why it's very difficult to get a handle on. From Kaepernick's perspective, it began uh, last season uh, when he began kneeling uh, for the national anthem before San Francisco 49ers games in an effort to show solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. And a handful of other players uh, had done that in the NFL last year. A few other athletes in other sports, Megan Rapino, I believe, in American women's soccer, and a few others. And then this season, it turned into two other things more or less simultaneously, One, it turned into a protest of the fact that Kaepernick was not signed as a free agent this year, despite being obviously better than a fairly substantial percentage of the other quarterbacks in the NFL. And then that fact was politicized by the president, not only in tweets, but at a rally in Alabama, political rally in Alabama, where he was endorsing the primary opponent of Ray Moore, where he referred uh, to Colin Kaepernick, if I may use uh, the vernacular since the president did, uh, as a son of a bitch, that son of a bitch should be fired, which drew a big reaction from the crowd, uh, which then turned it into something forcing the NFL as a whole to respond to the fact that the president of the United States had attacked most of its labor force. So like a lot of things we deal with when we deal with the political culture, it's kind of two or three moving pieces all at once. How has Trump and others' critiques impacted and even reshaped public understandings of the protests? Well, I think what Trump had to say and the way he was framing it, especially after that political rally, immediately after the political rally, the response to him uh, and the criticism of him disparaging Colin Kaepernick and African-American players was an attempt to change the narrative, right? That the problem is nobody, and certainly not these people, uh, should uh, disrespect the flag. And so the question of police violence against African-Americans suddenly becomes secondary, uh, that the problem with this isn't even a free speech issue. It's a Uh, disrespect the flag, a disrespect to veterans, a disrespect to America as a whole, which was neither the intention nor the purpose, nor even really a a, a part of what was the plan uh, in terms of raising attention. Now, certainly there have been those who had uh, criticized Kaepernick and those who were taking a knee early on, but Trump's statements and then his attempt to justify his statements on those grounds really amplified Uh, that particular criticism and critique. And that really dominated the narrative, I think, going forward. And those who were protesting really had to try to, uh, and I don't think they have successfully done it yet, uh, Mm -hmm. switch the narrative back to focus on what the actual objective and purpose was. Trump's comments also encouraged a lot of guys who did not participate in the protest before to get more engaged. Uh, You look at Michael Thomas, uh, safety for the Miami Dolphins, his whole point was, 
his daughter can look back at this moment and say, okay, my daddy stood up for something, right? So where you may have had a handful of guys protesting on, you know, several teams, Trump's comments come out, and here you have the whole league protesting, right? You have the owners engaging in the, the kneeling, right? Uh, but then you also kind of see this hijacking of that narrative, right, with Jerry Jones, which becomes a whole other can of worms later on with that. So, But Trump, Trump kind of lit the fire under, under, under the asses of a lot of black, black players. So he simultaneously re-energized it even as he altered it in a way that we yeah. haven't gotten back yeah, to. Yeah, he yet. made it larger, but now we're having a conversation about Trump against the NFL, which was not the conversation Colin Kaepernick was trying to have in the first place. And the idea that these players are against the flag, against being disrespectful instead of the message that and, they and are even, trying to convey. And even that we're talking about the flag and Jerry mm-hmm. Jones instead of black lives mm-hmm. is not what Colin Kaepernick <laughs> was we set out to do in the first right. place. And what is the Jerry Jones thing? Jerry Jones is the owner of the Dallas Cowboys who has a series of other disagreements with the league right now. And and disagreements with black players. Yes, Jones <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> among the very the, you know <clears throat> last year when the discussion was primarily around Kaepernick, the response of the NFL kind of as an institution was both overwhelmingly negative but largely anonymous. There was a lot of reporting, even at the very beginning of the 2016 season last year, even before Trump was elected, even when we thought we were going to be having a very different political conversation this year, about how Kaepernick's career might be over and nobody would re-sign him. And there were a lot of general managers off the record talking about how much they despised that he was using the flag for this and, and so on and so forth. And it has turned into part of the larger discussion in the NFL about Roger Goodell's leadership, and Jerry Jones is both among the NFL owners who responded the most negatively publicly to the initial protests, and the NFL owner currently the most at odds with Goodell and the leadership of the NFL for reasons having little to, again, little to do with the original political content of the protest last year. And Jones is also one of a, a few few owners who has explicitly stated that none of his players best engaged in these protests. So people talk about athletes having the right as citizens to kneel, sit, stand, what have you. Jones is the one owner who is stating explicitly that they better not do this. Some teams have let their players decide. Some teams have chosen to decide as a team what to do, but with some input from players rather than just being announced from on high. But the Cowboys are one of the teams that that issued team orders essentially at the beginning of the process. And have players been following these orders? I don't believe any Cowboys have gone against that. I'm not positive about that. Not since the collective initial response to Trump. I don't think anyone has. Now, one player did raise, he did have a raised fist, but that was more so once the anthem ended, that's when he proceeded to raise his fist. So there was a bit of backlash on his end, but nobody kneeled or sat during the anthem. So one of the common refrains that we keep hearing around all of the political controversy surrounding these protests is that sports shouldn't be political. So why is there this idea that sports should be apolitical? And has it always been our expectation of athletes that they just play the game? You have to look at it from different viewpoints, right? Because personally speaking, I've always seen sports and politics intertwine. Uh, looking at, you know, coming out of the South, My father was a a big fan of Jim Brown and the Browns back in the day because they were the the one NFL team that brought in a lot of black players, right? And so although he grew up in South Carolina, the Cleveland Cleveland Browns was really black America's team. And so Bill Willis, who is an Ohio State alum, he's one of the uh, four gentlemen who integrate uh, the NFL, playing with the Cleveland Browns, who was head coached by Paul Brown, who was also the head coach of Ohio State football, right? So for African-Americans... You know, you have guys who've always been outspoken, right? You look at Jim Brown, you look at John Wooten, you look at Walter Beach, Jim Shorter, right? Curtis McClendon with the Kansas City Chiefs. You look at Muhammad Ali. For these guys, there were no overwhelming number of, of athletes during this time period speaking out on the issues, right? The issue is that they were doing it. And so I think for that generation, Jim Brown, Russell Ali, they served as, as the example, right? Now, you can talk about the 80s and 90s coming on with Michael Jordan and and kind of the silent nature of the black athlete coming to the fold. But there was a long history of this connection between sports and politics. 
and certainly a long history in some ways of whether or not there are any black athletes on the field at all and under what circumstances, itself being political before we even have a conversation about attitudes or behavior of those athletes once they're included. You know, we're having a conversation about athletes using boycott techniques or threatening their the personal career opportunities in sport in order to try to achieve something political. And in many ways, in the late 19th and early 20th century, there's almost an analogy to white players or executives in a number of sports using the kind of protest techniques we're talking about right now, specifically to keep African Americans out, specifically to, as they would have said at the time, draw the color line. Uh, so in some ways, you know, we're having a conversation here about the politics of what kind of speech you will or won't engage in once you're in the arena. But from certain perspectives and for certain populations, being in the arena at all is political before you even start having that secondary conversation. And I think an extension of that degree of politics, uh, we often think about professional sports, but when you look at college sports and college football, the number of times schools that might have had one or two black ball players in the North, whether it's uh, Michigan in the 1930s or NYU, uh, when they go to play Southern teams, the decisions that are made that we're not going to bring the black ball players, we're not going to play because we don't want to go against the norms of segregation or racial segregation. That's politics. So there is this much longer history of sports, both professional and amateur, uh, big, big dollar sports, constantly intersecting uh, with politics. In fact, I will go so far as to say there has never been a time when sports has not been political, where sports has not intersected with politics in one shape or another, where it's on the field or it's in the front office. I think for a lot of fans, for sports, they provide an escape. But to not acknowledge the issues that a lot of these athletes are bringing up is, in, 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 in essence, denying their humanity, right? You talk about this shut up and play philosophy that has existed, right? You talked about you know, the northern schools going down south and kind of abiding by the gentleman's agreement. And so the, there, there's also this gentleman's agreement that we're not, we're not supposed to talk about, you know, politics within sports, right? But you see the breaking from this. And I think it's, it's, it's a great time. And, but the, the larger issue, I think, you know, as I mentioned, you know, with college athletics, you know, and what role can they play with these particular protests? We see professional athletes doing it. Uh, and a large number of NFL players whose contracts aren't guaranteed, right? You see the bulk of these protests coming from guys whose contracts aren't guaranteed. So what does it really speak to these issues if they're willing to put their livelihood on, on, the, on the front line, right? Kaepernick, who opted out of his contract to 49ers. Now, they said they were going to cut him anyway, right? But he opted out of his contract, you know, looking to get another, with another team, still couldn't do it. So you see the power of politics just in him stating, I'm looking at it from the Black Lives Matter perspective and not so much disrespect to the country. Nate Boyer, who was a former NFL player and also served in the military, he spoke to him about taking the knee, Right. Because at first he was sitting. Now he, he moved to, to taking a knee. So even when you have military servicemen talk about the, the symbolism of taking a knee, folks tend to just kind of push that off and ignore that argument. Is there something special about sports specifically that make it a good forum for protest? Certainly sport is among the places in society where you find examples of the athletes finding a large audience, maybe in some ways whether they're seeking a large audience or not. Whether or not you would say in retrospect those things have been effective from a policy or a cultural standpoint is maybe another kind of, of question. But for a lot of, of consumers of the product, it's certainly a place in the culture where politics erupts on them when they think they've avoided it. You know, keep the politics out of sport is kind of in some ways keep politics out of my weekend, which is easy to say if your relationship with the NFL is on the weekend through the television, but a much more difficult line to draw if your relationship is actually an active one uh, in creation of the product. And I also think it's a keep a certain kind of politics out of my weekend, right? Because the playing of a national anthem, moments of silence, those are all political decisions, right? Flyovers by the Department of Defense. I mean, so politics is intertwined even when we like to pretend that they aren't. Uh, so I would say that it's a, it's, a, it's a point of clarification. Keep particular politics explicitly, keep racial politics uh, out of this. I mean, we have, whether it's uh, breast cancer awareness and all these other things. I mean, these are these are all still somewhat political. 
uh, but it's a particular kind of what some would feel inflammatory politics, as they say, keep out. But in reality, you know, we live with politics on Saturdays and Sundays. Why do we sing the national anthem at sporting events? And when did we start playing it at sporting events? The tradition, as we understand it, playing it specifically in a national ceremonial role is generally credited to have happened for the first time at the 1918 World Series at the beginning of American involvement in World War I, uh, where it was apparently played uh, during the seventh inning stretch and was such a big success that they played it the rest of the series, which is generally credited with starting a tradition of it being used in baseball occasionally in a ceremonial role. And I say occasionally in part because if it's 1925 and you want to play the the national anthem before the game, you have to hire a brass band. And it was not really until World War II that it began to be played regularly at the beginning of commercial baseball and football games, which was a time when they were playing the national anthem at the beginning of all kinds of things. And the idea that it would be played regularly just as a normal thing at the beginning of a contest appears to have been a World War II convention that then survived World War II. And the NFL in particular went out of its way to put in the rules, okay, we're going to do this before every game from here on out. One of the things that does change in in recent memory is post-9-11. We find, whether it's after Pearl Harbor or after 9-11, this uh, increase in sort of patriotic fervor. Uh, Most teams, this is Major League Baseball, so in the uh, seventh inning stretch, singing God Bless America, either before or after, most teams have gone away from that. New York Yankees, I think, are the only team. New York Mets might be one of the only teams uh, that have kept that on. But I think it's symbolic of this push for um, sort of political patriotism uh, following these sort of moments of uh, national crises. So considering that the majority of NFL players are black and an overwhelming majority of fans are white, how do demographics impact outlooks on these protests? Well, I think I think a couple things. One, just in terms of sheer numbers, you're going to have more white people who are fans. Uh, but then there's also a equating of fandom with whiteness. You heard most recently Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL, uh, talking about, well, fans don't like this. Well, there's plenty of black fans uh, that are fine with this. So... So on the one hand, I think we have to be clear. It's helpful to be clear about whether we're talking about white fans or black fans or fans of color or whatnot. Among white fans, uh, there is very much this sense of encroachment of issues into their leisure, recreational moments of escape that becomes problematic in a particular setting. Right. So white fans in the NFL don't want to have these issues brought up. In large numbers, is far from a majority, um, far from a clear majority. But NASCAR fans are okay with the Confederate flag, like sort of waving and, and sort of that aspect of uh, sort of bringing up conversations about race and racism and what does it mean and legacy. I mean, so I, I just think it's very selective. Uh, but it's, but I think it's important too that when we're talking about sort of fans of sports, that in this instance. Uh, it really necessitates identifying by race as well. Also, when you talk about race and demographics, you need to consider, let's say, Major League Baseball. For example, Adam Jones, outfielder for the Baltimore Orioles, he spoke on the lack of black ball players and, and, and their willingness to protest the anthem because of the overwhelming number of white fans, right? And you also think about uh, when white athletes began to speak upon these issues, right? Dale Earnhardt, who's a, a big name in NASCAR, talked about how protesting the anthem was something that was, you know, Kaepernick's right. So showing support there. Aaron Rodgers encouraging the fans to link arms on the anthem. Did it happen? No. So we can talk about black athletes in their role. We can talk about white, white athletes in their role. But the larger picture is a lot of fans do not want these political statements being made for something they see as, as fun time, right? A time they can drink beers, get hamburgers and pretzels, right? What kinds of issues have past protests centered on? Have they been similar or different? The person we keep almost talking about and not talking about, so maybe I'll just say his name out loud at this point, is Ali. Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion in the 1960s, who is generally sort of considered the 
the platonic ideal of when we have a conversation about to what degree are athletes able to be political, to what degree are athletes taking risks when being political, Ali is usually the example of someone who risked everything to be the political person in public he wanted to be. And his politics combined opposition to the Vietnam War with a fairly robust black nationalism, I think it's fair to say, in the 1960s, which I think people today forget how aggressive the black nationalism was and how powerful a combination that was and making very little effort to engage with the actual content of the Nation of Islam in the mid-1960s. When we criticize an athlete for not being willing to be political in the arena, in, in many ways Ali is the person whose career they're being compared against. And the, the also connection there when you talk about this black nationalism coupled with this, this religious difference that Islam presents, right? I think that's something we also have to consider when we talk about what it means to be an American citizen because we talk about being a Christian nation. You often hear that, that point, right? I think one of the things that we also have to consider when we, we talk about recent protests in the last 30 years and, and, and is linked with Islam, if you look at Craig Hodges, his letter that he wrote to George H. W. Bush back in the, the mid-90s after the Bulls won the championship, and also Chris Jackson, who becomes Mahmoud abdul Rauf, and he's actually protesting the national anthem, right? He, he's kind of the forefather to, to Colin Kaepernick. And, and the personal antidote for him, he also influenced me to kind of turn my back during the national anthem when I played, right? So you have guys who serve as, as a, yeah, a nice example of what peaceful protest can look like, addressing the issues that African-Americans encounter in the, in the United States. And sport kind of serves as that role. But we also have to look at what role does religion play in how these particular protests are embraced. And I think Ali, Hodges, and Abdul Rauf are, are, are a great example. But isn't this a process of historical amnesia of we remember the Muhammad Ali that we lost just a few years ago and he was silenced by that time by disease. And so they remember the silent Ali and they forget the radical Ali and, and their lack of engagement and, with black nationalism and, and shows there, that. And there was also an Ali between the radical Ali and the silenced Ali, which was the Muhammad Ali in the 1970s who appeared on the Dean Martin Celebrity Roast. He was initially presented to the country overwhelmingly as a black entertainment figure. And then for a while in the mid-60s was the nation's most famous black nationalist. And by the late 70s had kind of turned back into, in some ways turned back into the, the entertainment figure again as the Vietnam War got less visceral in American politics uh, and as his own religion became less connected to the black nationalism of the Nation of Islam in the 1960s and became more conventional. And, and in some ways, it's hard to know what Ali people are praising because of how many there were to choose from. And he was hated in the 1960s, yes. wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, enormously polarizing. And I think it's worth pointing out that there really is a degree to which he got more famous and more beloved as an international symbol of American political tolerance as he literally got quieter. You know, by 1996, he lights the torch at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, which most people remember if they have a firsthand memory of it for the frail physical condition he was in by that time. You know, the young Muhammad Ali was both a fantastically charismatic physical athlete and fantastically charismatic verbally. And by the 90s, he was among the most famous and beloved Americans at the moment in his life when he was literally neither of those things anymore. Have any of these past sports protest movements proven to be effective? Have they actually inspired change? I think to different degrees, they have proven effective. I think it also depends upon how you want to define effective. Mm -hmm. uh, most protests, many protests are, I think Kaepernick's is one, uh, is designed to raise awareness. And by raising awareness to affect some type of change that way. So in that sense, it certainly has raised awareness. You don't always get to control the narrative when things come out, uh, but in that sense, it has. I think other protests symbolically have remained powerful, continue to exist in sort of popular memory and imagination. You don't always know why. I think Mark's point was great. It was like, we're supposed to love Muhammad Ali uh, because he stood up for the courage of his convictions. Well, what were his convictions? Well, well I'm not <laughs> quite sure, but we were supposed to. Yeah. I mean, so sometimes it gets lost in time. But I think you almost have to evaluate each one. 
and be clear about what is it that the protest is for. How is how does it play out in the moment? But then I think you also have to look back over the years uh, with the benefit of time and say, okay, how how how, how was this remembered? And, and how did people respond to this? Because sometimes there's a protest in the moment and you don't think it's quite effective or it doesn't work or it spins out of control. And then you look back five years, 10 years, 15 years later, and you're like, that was the spark that really led to something different. Or it was working, but it pulled terribly, which I think is something we tend to forget about the classic the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s was not popular even as it was, in fact, beginning to succeed. And sometimes, you know, I think Hassan's point is well taken, sometimes you can't know if that's what was happening or not until you have some historical distance from it. Certainly Gallup would have told you in 1963 that Martin Luther King was was unsuccessful as an American public figure, but that's not remotely how we think of him in the long view. Well, let's get back to the players and the owners and coaches a little bit, too, with this protest. How does teammate unity with the current NFL protest compare to earlier displays of teammate solidarity or disunity, such as when Jackie Robinson integrated baseball in 1947? You can almost say it's it's, it's pretty much on par uh, with with the Dodgers. Branch Rickey kind of gave, you know, the Dodgers brass, the team, you know, a a year heads up to kind of like, hey, you know, Robinson is – it's going to be on the team in, in a year, right? Uh, and so some some guys resisted it, some guys accepted it. And the same thing with the current, you know, protest now. You don't see an overwhelming number of white athletes supporting these protests. When I say overwhelming, I'm saying the majority, right? You might see a couple of guys, you know, with their hand on their teammate's shoulder. But for the most part, you don't really – you don't see this, this large support as we, we may have hoped. Except – and this is what I think is important to think about in terms of gender. So outside of the NFL, WNBA, you go to, you go to WNBA, much more robust, yeah. much more robust in terms of protests itself, but then also the solidarity yeah. uh, among white athletes and uh, black athletes. So among women athletes, women professional athletes, you have seen much greater solidarity across racial lines on teams than you have uh, within the NFL. But you also have to consider – when we talk about teammate support, right? How many, let's say, white athletes understand the issues of their African American teammates, right? If you look at uh, one of the one of the Browns players, white white athlete on the Browns, he actually took a knee, right? You look at Travis Kelsey with the Kansas City Chiefs, he uh, he supported those efforts too. And ironically, both of them have black wives or black girlfriends, right? So when we talk about issues that pertain to African Americans, how many white athletes understand those issues? Drew Brees. You know, he talked about, you know, he would never disrespect the anthem, but he's kind of speaking from this, 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 this ignorance of not understanding those issues, right? He talked about historical amnesia, right? When you look at the phrase, make America great again, but if you ask a lot of people of color, they may make the argument America's never really been great. So among fans, at least, as we've discussed, it seems like the NFL protests is unpopular. So too, however, as you mentioned, were the civil rights protests of the 1950s and 60s, they're now celebrated. So what do you think will happen with the current NFL protests as time unfolds? I think there's unpopular and then there's unpopular. So the sit-ins of the 1960s, nonviolent direct action, uh, was very unpopular among white folk, right? Um, not only in the South, not only segregationists, but outside the South as well. But if you look at polling for uh, taking a knee, it's not by 1960 standards – like, this is a celebration. I mean, <laughs> sort of negative. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of 65, 60, 60, 40 uh, in a sort of broader white public. It changes among African Americans, 60 opposed, 44, right? The, the right to protest. I mean, if you, even if it's even if that's high, even if it's 30 percent, 35 percent are approving. I mean, that is that. Is, I mean, King would have Snick would have been <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, like victory. They would have declared victory. So, I mean, I think. I think it's a different moment, and if anything, I I think that bodes well for um, what the end goal is, right? Sort of raising awareness and actually having people address these sort of issues of black lives and police violence. So I think they're on the right course. The question is, can you stay the course? Because there's a lot of pressure not to. 
I mean, I'm surprised that it's still going on now, right? Because mm-hmm. you see Kaepernick initiated it, but it's good to see those other torchbearers keep it keep it moving. You also got to consider the point that he made the 60-40, the 70-30 breakdown. If you would go to the east side of Columbus, or you'd go to Harlem, New York, you go to Decatur, Georgia, where I'm from, overwhelming number of people would, would be in support of these protests, right? So you have to kind of ask yourself, what particular groups of people are against the protests, right? We know the owners are, we know Trump is, but if we ask, you know, are those players' families, are they in support of it, the people they went to school with, right? With regard to the popularity, I think it's it'd be interesting to sort of look at uh, sales of jerseys, for example. Like, mm-hmm. how do you sort of measure this? Kaepernick's uh, was, I believe, number one last year. It was very high. Yeah. Many, many were burning them, yeah. which is ironically, <laughs> yeah, you know. I, I don't know what the percentage of who bought them to torch them, but. But just as you have those who are burning his jersey, you have those who are dressing their kids in their jersey Halloween, yeah. for Halloween, right? Yeah. I mean, so it's, I think it's important to take the full measure when trying to assess how people are thinking about this. And again, it goes back to being clear about who we're talking about when we're talking about the fans. We're also in a new kind of golden age of sports viewership because of the way we are now consuming media, in particular Sports and news are literally the last two vestiges of Mm. sort of entertainment that we watch and consume live. Mm. That's part of the reason why its value has uh, to broadcast networks has it has really exploded over the last 10 years. And the NFL has really uh, capitalized on that. But it's not just the NFL. I mean, the reason why baseball uh, media contracts are so high, why the Big Ten network uh, is, is, you know, all these college networks exist, why March Madness is so valuable, uh, because you get live eyeballs. We're consuming our media, other forms of uh, entertainment at our own leisure. And so I think that heightens the power and visibility of black athletes, of athletes in general, to raise awareness on uh, questions uh, that are affecting society. But it also, and we see this in the NFL, it also concerns and worries owners and management because the stakes are so high. I just, I just think from, from my vantage point, I just think as sport is kind of bringing into conversation what does it mean to be American. I think, and also being a scholar on these particular issues is great because now I have a lot more to write on, right? I don't have to write about things <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. I can write about current issues. Uh, if you look at, uh, there's a player at, uh, at a D3 school, Albright College in Pennsylvania. He took a knee, he was cut from the team, right? And his parents were kind of like, oh, he's back to normal, you know, as, as if nothing happened. And I think for a lot of kids, they're starting to understand that, hey, they can stand on principle. Mm-hmm. That's what we really, really have to embrace as American citizens, that there are principles in which we identify and are we going to live by them. So we'll wrap it up on that note. Thank you to our three guests, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, Robert Bennett, and Mark Horger. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. This episode of History Talk podcast was brought to you by Origins, Current Events, and Historical Perspective, an online publication of the Public History Initiative and the Goldberg Center, and the History Department at The Ohio State University in Columbus and Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Our main editors are Steve Kahn and Nicholas Breifogel. Our executive producer is David Staley. Our audio and technical advisor is Paul Kotheimer. Our audio producers and hosts are Brenna Miller and Jessica Venus Nelson. Song and band information can be found on our website. You can find our podcasts and more on our website at origins.osu.edu, on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And as always, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks for listening.